Welcome to Resilient Leadership, How to Manage Through Crisis, part of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by R&D Altanova. Oh, there you go. I wanted to show you what their uh, logo looked like there and offered in value partnership with Tech United New Jersey. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors are coming together to help our students by raising awareness and funds for the 1000 Laptop Challenge. Students and their families have experienced financial hardships as a direct result of COVID-19, and their move to a remote learning environment requires unanticipated technology investments for them, such as laptops. You can help. We'll be uh, closing the webinar today with more information about how you can be part of this important RBS initiative. Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series is a relatively new learning opportunity that brings you lessons of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention through bi-weekly conversations with thought leaders and business leaders from across industry spectrums. We're excited to chat with Joe Stinziano of Samsung Electronics America so he can share glimpses of his everyday real-life challenges as well as lessons from his leadership playbook. And here to help us get to know Joe better and to facilitate today's discussion is our moderator, Phil Cohn. Phil joined Samsung Electronics America as Senior Vice President Sales, Consumer Retail Sales in 2017. He's responsible for this very long list of things that I'm going to try to get through. The go-to market strategy and sales execution in all U.S. retail channels and owning the customer relationships and delivering the sales management plan across multiple categories, as well as being accountable for providing supporting omnichannel initiatives and improving sales capabilities. Whew. Phil is an industry veteran with more than 25 years experience in electronics, retail, and entertainment, working for employers including Barnes & Noble, D&M Holdings, Sony, and TouchTunes Interactive Networks. He is a proud and loyal Rutgers alumnus, having earned both his Bachelor of Science and MBA in Marketing from the Business School. And it is a genuine pleasure to welcome Phil Cohen to moderate today's Signature Leadership Series webinar. Phil, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you for the introduction. Boy, uh, sounds like I do a lot. I need to talk to Joe about my salary after this call. Um, but if you think that's impressive, that's nothing compared to Joe, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Joe serves as the Executive Vice President of Samsung Electronics America, uh, based in Richfield Park, New Jersey. Uh, he oversees basically all the sales and marketing for our categories uh, that we bring to market, including TV, audio, home appliances, uh, and enterprise display categories. He's an industry veteran for over 30 years, as am I, but I didn't update it. I wanted to seem a little younger. Uh, Joe previously held senior leadership roles at AT&T Lucent, Sony, and DNM Holdings. Uh, he currently serves on the board of directors for Junior Achievement of New Jersey and the Consumer Technology Association. Joe is a proud alumnus of Rutgers School of Engineering, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, be a moderator and uh, share some of Joe's insights and my insights maybe on leadership. So, uh, you know, as the opening stated, uh, Joe and I, uh, you know, are friends and colleagues and met on the banks of the Raritan about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, I've had the uh, enjoyable uh, career uh, path of working with Joe at different companies and watching him lead uh, at different companies. And I'm excited for him to share some of his insights as we talk uh, during the session. Uh, but to have, you know, us address kind of uh, how we are managing crisis or how Joe manages crisis in the very uh, changing environment we've been in, especially the last five months, I think uh, we should start from the beginning. So, uh, Joe, I'd love for you to walk us through your career journey. And uh, now you're at Samsung running sales and marketing. Uh, you know, what excites you about doing that? Thanks, Phil. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's staying uh, safe and healthy out there. Uh, it's our privilege to be with you guys today. So uh, looking forward to a fun conversation. So, you know, Phil, for me, my background, uh, we, we both started on the banks, as you say, and um, 
you know, it was a great, it was a great start for our careers. Uh, but I, I took a circuitous route, if you will. Um, graduated engineering, uh, and then decided pretty quickly that I wasn't sure I wanted to do engineering. So uh, I did some bartending and some different things until I could uh, get my feet under me. And uh, just by, you know, kind of happenstance, I, I was waiting on a guy from AT and T, and we started hitting it up. And he says, "You know, do you ever think about doing sales?" Uh, so that was my first job, and I started in sales there. So you never know, uh, you know, where the opportunities might come from. But uh, it's been a wonderful career. I've been fortunate to work with people uh, like Phil uh, throughout that whole time. And now the last uh, 10 and a half years here at Samsung, uh, and it took me about five years to convince Phil to come join me. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I could do that. Uh, you know, the, the environment we're in right now, uh, academically, it's, it's really interesting. And it's fascinating, actually, as to what's going on. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about that through the, through the morning and the afternoon, I guess. But, you know, for me right now, what's exciting is trying to understand and read the tea leaves, I think is most interesting for, for what's going on. We, we can see the macroeconomic conditions and, and they're very clear, uh, but it's very different by segments. Um, and just to kind of put it out there in the beginning, uh, it's a little bit almost embarrassment of riches. You know, consumers are buying a lot of consumer products right now. Um, and we're, we're struggling to keep up with the demand. So why is that and, and, and what's going on? It's, very, it's fascinating and interesting academically uh, when you start diving into consumer behaviors uh, and what's going on. So Phil, I'll pause there for a second. You, uh, if you want to guide me to some other direction or we can take it from there. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just because you've worked for so many different companies, right? And by the way, the first time Joe was my boss was at uh, Rutgers. Uh, he was my supervisor when I was an usher at the Rutgers Athletic Center. So I got to I got to understand his leadership style very early on, and then our paths crossed at a bunch of different companies. I and, never put uh, you by the band, Phil, remember that. No, that's that's true, that's true. Uh, but Joe, I think it's important for us to kind of talk about what are the core tenets of how you lead, and uh, then bring us to Samsung and maybe how uh, you know those tenants either changed or expanded based on Samsung's culture and, and the environment that we're in. Yeah, so let's start maybe with with uh, the Samsung culture a little bit. Um, you know, Samsung is a company that grew out of uh, uh, the Korean War. Um, and at that point after the war, South Korea is one of the poorest countries on the planet. Uh, and you could easily see that the, there was a need for some large companies to kind of take hold. Similar to, I'd say, the 20th century in the U.S., where the Carnegies, uh, the Rockefellers, et cetera, kind of took hold of the country and, and drove an industrial revolution. Um, there are companies like Samsung. Uh, Kia uh, and some others you're probably not as familiar with that uh, helped the country really rise out of the post-war. So out of that came an extraordinarily aggressive attitude uh, to take on big, bold challenges, uh, but also a fiscal conservativeness relative to the Asian financial crisis of the late 80s and 90s. Uh, so that's the unique combination that Phil and I live in every day, just to give you a little bit of that background. Um, but it's also an environment where we really value scenario planning. And I think as we talk about, you know, this leadership through crisis, I think that's been one of the most important things that we've been able to lean on uh, during this time is this scenario planning. So for example, um, during normal times, uh, maybe we're thinking about a competitive situation or an opportunity, uh, and, and we like to do uh, war game planning basically and, and have our brightest minds take the role of our competitors and, and think about how would you attack us and what would you do and, and then how would we react and play that chess game all the way through. Uh, so we do that as a matter of practice and I think that was an important kind of baseline for us because as COVID started to hit, uh, at Samsung we, we kind of started to prioritize uh, how we were gonna attack this problem. And I think it's, it's applicable across no matter what industry you're in. Our first priority is pretty obvious I think, but was safeguarding our, our own people and our own employees. Right, so how do we do that? What are the real issues? Um, many of us are extraordinarily fortunate to be able to have a job and a role where we can live at home and work from home. Uh, but many in Samsung and many outside of this industry, the service industry and frontline uh, workers don't have that. So we had to make sure we safeguarded those folks first and foremost, procuring PPE, making sure we had proper protocols, working with CDC, WHO guidelines, et cetera. So that, that was really first and foremost. Second. Uh, we set up what we call a PMO, a project management office. Many of you have these disciplines as well, I'm sure. Uh, but that we met daily for the first three and a half months uh, of, of this crisis. And the entire leadership team of Samsung would meet. Uh, it would be a very brief 40-minute meeting. 
uh, where we would share what's going on strictly related to COVID issues. And it would allowed us to quickly learn and benchmark from each other. Uh, we looked at other companies, other industries, uh, and to make sure that we were doing everything we possibly could uh, for our people and our employees. So that was number one. The second thing we did was we had to protect the business, of course, right? We're a public company and, and we have to take care of our shareholders and, and, and our customers. So what was going on in the marketplace at that time? Well, the supply chain was a big question. Uh, at first, it was products coming out of China that were going to be impacted and what were we going to do? Uh, we were fortunate at our company, we have 110 plus manufacturing locations. So we were able to diversify. So that was, it was a fun exercise. But where else can we get product and how do we single and dual and multi-source? Um, but, but that's just, that's just the beginning of it. Um, we then had to say, okay, from our customer base, where customers shop today, is that how they're going to shop uh, over the next hundred days, if you will? And, and certainly it was not. Uh, and then we have, B2B businesses, where, as you can imagine, um, in a corporate office, like our office has been shut down for three and a half months in New Jersey, um, we're not buying products to to make that office higher technology or more efficient. And that was going on around the country. We also sell to uh, hospitality and leisure industry, where you can imagine that just completely stopped. Um, so first, protecting the people. Second, protecting the business the best we could and scenario planning all that out. And you know, where there were materials coming for the U.S. that we couldn't use, we would send them to another region and, and vice versa. And then third was beginning, at least at this point, to prepare for what we thought would be the recovery. Uh, at some point, you know, the, the business will turn around. And in some of our segments, uh, frankly, the shape of those curves is very different. It, some never really went down or just bottomed a little bit. Uh, and some, like uh, you can imagine, we're selling to the cruise ship industry, to uh, the hospitality industry, uh, that has plummeted and it frankly has is is not coming back yet. Uh, but eventually all businesses will return at some level uh, and we have to plan for that. So those are the three stages of our thinking, Phil, you know, protect the people, yeah. uh, think think about protecting the business and then start to plan for that recovery. Uh, and I think the scenario planning uh, framework that we use really enabled us to think about this academically, um, a lot of emotional things were going on and protecting livelihoods and people's safety and health, but at the same time, uh, trying to compartmentalize all that. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And certainly a lot to digest uh, and a lot of speed and resiliency uh, around that um, and pivoting and reinventing. A lot of the R's that, that Margaret talked about at the beginning from Rutgers. Oh, okay, I'll I'll take that lead. Um, so, you know, the people joining us probably here and, and could get a sense of your style. There's a lot of we, a lot of us and Samsung's, you know, marching order for all of us and our rallying cry is hungry and humble. And certainly, you know, you drive that, uh, you know, we always want to innovate, do better. It comes from the culture and, the, and how Samsung was founded, but being humble and understanding the responsibility that comes with being a leader and, and innovating and bringing products to market that people need especially in this environment, but but in their day-to-day -day lives and, and actually doing things and more efficiently and more effectively. But I want to double click a little bit and get to the I part, you. Because one of the things that I really admire about your leadership is how you remain cool under pressure, how you listen, uh, you like to take um, you know feedback from people and and you provide constructive direction. Um, and by the way, just as a, a, a an aside related to how you're cool under pressure, uh, people should uh, get a kick out of maybe Googling um, Michael Bay, CES, and Joe Stinziano. Go on Google oh boy. Uh, and watch on YouTube, uh, and you'll get a great example of what it's probably a cringe-worthy event, but how calm and collected you were. For those that don't know, the Consumer Electronics Show is the biggest trade show in the world. It's where all um, manufacturers uh, launch their new products. And example of you know uh, the experience Joe had with Michael Bay, who's a famous director, um, uh, something that could have gone terribly wrong, and how Joe recovered and and handled it with respect and thoughtfulness uh, for the company, for Michael Bay, and I think for uh, everyone who is watching. So Google that, Michael Bay CES. Anyway, Joe, double clicking in. Talk to me about your leadership style, not what Samsung did, but what your style is and how it may have changed during this crisis or evolved. 
Sure, sure. So I think Phil's, yeah, so first of all, when you, when you Google that, just <laughs> while I watch it, it's still cringeworthy for me. Um, it was a gulp moment, and I don't wish that on anyone, but uh, you, you definitely learn a little bit about yourself during those moments. Uh, yeah, Phil, I think, you know, it's interesting. We think about our style, um, and, and the humble and hungry piece uh, for me uh, really started resonating, I, I think, when I, I, you start working for some Asian companies. You and I both work for Sony. Right mm -hmm. there, there's a humility I think uh, to the Asian culture that uh, I, I find uh, extraordinarily respectful, and, and there's something there about the hunger though that also has to be there for it to work, and that's why this humble but hungry thing for me uh, is is such an important feel. Um, I think my style over time, you know, as you take on more responsibilities and move through organizations, uh, you naturally uh, have to take on more responsibility, but you also have to. Uh, absorb more. And, you know, one day I was in a room and we were talking and, um, you know, top management or leaders or them, you know, they, be, I became them. Uh, and, and that pivot in your mind were saying, like, okay, I'm not waiting anymore for anyone to make that decision. I guess I have to make the decision. And I knew that when I was not in this role, I wished people would have asked me more about what was going on. So for me, it was about being empathetic to everyone around me and understanding and listening um, and trying to take it all in as feedback. Uh, but then ultimately uh, coming to peace with the fact that you have to make that decision. And when you make that decision, you know, we'll all hold arms as we say and go forward. But I think, you know, during this crisis more than ever, um, this is an all hands on deck moment. This is not a, a moment for, you know, complete top down direction and, and being a little bit blind, which can be helpful at times uh, to, to rally an organization. But this is a time where it's all hands on deck. Uh, where we had to come together as a team, uh, we all have different skills. Um, you know, Phil, your 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 communication skills with your team are are second to none, um, right? And, and I've taken a lot of your best practices and and spread them out across Samsung. So, uh, I think more than ever during this time of COVID, we've learned uh, that it, it's a team. It, it's kind of corny and it's a cliche, uh, but there's no way. Like last night, I made a presentation. Phil, you and I were talking before to our global CFO. Um, and I was able to be the tip of the spear for Samsung, and it was very, it was very humbling, and 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 I was honored to be able to present it. But you guys did all the hard work. Uh, so for me, my role now is to just try to set people up for success. Um, yeah. You know, and in this moment of COVID, uh, sometimes you need things simple as resources. You know, you you need PPE or you need you know clarity on something. You want to take care of your folks and send them a little gift card. I need to, you know, my job in those moments was to clear the decks of all the noise. Um, and, and try to make sure that we, we uh, can give you the, the opportunity to be successful. So I think that the leadership style, we all adapt and we all change over time. Um, we all take things from each other. Um, I think the most important thing you can do as a leader uh, is surround yourself with the proper diverse team, diverse thinking, uh, folks who, who look and sound and think differently than you. Um, it's still an opportunity in technology. You know, we're not good at it yet. Um, you know, we, we don't have enough diversity in our industry in general, um, and, and we need to do a better job. But I think it's so important that I have, you know, different leaders who I can lean on to say, okay, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Um, there's not always moments for that. Sometimes it's more about, hey, we've got to rally around this and let's just go. Um, this wasn't one of those moments. This was a moment to, to kind of hold hands and, and think about it more collectively. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And, th and thanks for the props on the communication. You know, for me, uh, it's interesting, and again, our paths zigs and zag together at different companies, so we, you know, we have that kind of yin and yang thing. Um, but for me, you know, leadership always is about the people, and you know, uh, you know, creating clarity for the team, no matter what, so there's mm -hmm. not, you know, inefficiency. Um, creating guidance and support. And, you know, you and I have talked about this. Our greatest accomplishment is when we see people we've managed move up and take on more responsibility and be promoted and be successful. Um, I think what's interesting during the last five months, and actually today is five months since we were in the office, or at least since I've been in the office, which is crazy, um, especially for people like you and me who are usually on planes 70% of the time, um, you know, domestically and internationally. Um, but when I think about the last five months, um, I think it's really, you know, like you said, we have a great core of leaders and, you know, you and I have come up uh, through uh, the leadership ranks. And I think we've developed skills that really focus on getting the best out of people. 
Um, and I think the last five months has been really about magnifying that. So, yeah, you know, we talk about connections and, and making sure you're listening to people. Um, you know, uh, just some, some real world things I've been doing, uh, you know, I've been having, you know, not only skip level, but skip, skip level meetings. I had two this morning and it's amazing how just having those one-on-ones with the people on the front lines, uh, really make a difference, not only to them, but to energize us as leaders and get information, but also just, you know, thanking people for their support more than we usually do over the last five months when everyone is kind of, you know, sequestered in their homes. Um, and then I think, you know, connecting in other areas and us all looking for creative ways to do that, right? Um, yeah, and think, you've done some of that too. Yeah, I think, Phil, it's interesting. We've we've all gone through this evolution now of our feelings and emotions and thinking about how to manage through COVID. In the beginning, there was this shock to the system, right? I remember watching the newsreel and seeing what was going on in Italy and saying, oh my goodness, that's that's so far away, but that's so terrible, but let me get back to my world here. Um, you know, I didn't personally think this could happen. Um, then they started talking about shutting down European cities. And I remember saying and thinking, well, that could never happen in the US. And, you know, here we are, but we went through that initial shock and then everyone, you know, in corporate environment was able to work from home in many cases. And then we figured out, okay, we actually can do this a little bit. And then we were so proud of ourselves, I think as a society, an organization that we could function at a pretty high level uh, dur yeah. during this and all the technology uh, played into that. And we were using technology in a way that we had never done before, never leaned on it before. And, and now we're coming on the other side and, you know, in the Northeast, if I'm being honest, I, I thought we would be a little bit back to more normalcy uh, by July-ish. Um, and we thought we'd be back in the office, you know, during that time yeah. and it's just not happening. And now it's, it's obvious we're settling in for the longer haul. So now as leaders, I think we have to think about what does that mean for our teams? How do you lead through this crisis knowing uh, in the short term, we can, we're very resilient, uh, you know, as a species, uh, yeah. but as this becomes the new norm, now what, and, and how do you manage through that? Uh, a couple of things I'm thinking about are, first of all, um, as school starts up again, um, so many of our employees are going to be dealing with this schooling and education at home. Um, I learned a new word this week, uh, pods. Phil, have you heard this one? Pods of education? No. Um, kids, families are getting together um, and saying, okay, I guess I won't go to school, but we're going to hire someone uh, to teach maybe six kids in a pod. So, okay, that's a choice, but now I'm thinking for, that may be an opportunity. But our employees are home. How are they going to do their jobs when they're trying to take care of their kids? Um, and this is going to be a long haul. So I think as leaders, we have to think about how can we assist that? Is it more technology? Uh, is it an opportunity to uh, create extremely safe work environments where we can and give folks a, a space to go to when they need? Um, is it changing the way we, we manage our daily calendar? Um, like so many of you, um, <laughs> I remember one day many years ago, one of my children looked at my calendar and it was just full with meetings. And they asked me, they said, Dad, well, when do you actually do work if all you do is meetings, right? It's an interesting point of view. And right now I feel the same way that my, our entire day is one big video conference. Um, and, and we're not taking that time to get the energy from each other, first of all, but we're also not having carving out time to just do thoughtful planning. Uh, it's just yeah. reactive call after call after call. So. As leaders, we have to change that because I don't think this is sustainable at the rate we're going. Um, we've, we've done remarkable things, I think, as companies uh, to date. We've been able to deliver great results and, and take care of our customers incredibly well. Uh, but now this is a, a longer state. And, and I just think what got us here won't take us over the next six months. And I think it's pretty clear, at least through the holidays, this is how it's going to be. And then who knows, right? That CES yeah. show you mentioned, they just announced last week that they're canceling that show. Or I should say putting on a virtual show, uh, which which will be very interesting. So uh, leaders, I think we have to consider the cycle that everyone's going through in this COVID specifically. And then when we get back to new normal, um, you know, how do we plan for these eventualities? Uh, you know, you hear about these hundred year storms. We seem to get one a year now. Um, the, yeah. These things that were on the ends of the spectrum seem to be happening much more frequently uh, so as leaders, we have to be prepared, uh, think about the scenarios, take care of our employees, first of all, take care of the business, uh, and then continuously be flexible about how we think the new normal is coming to fruition. Yeah, Joe, we have a number of questions coming in, so I just want to touch on some that are relevant to the things you discussed. 
Um, first, what's the size of the people you manage? How big is your organization? Sure, 600 people. Right, and with that, has anything changed about uh, the organization in the last five months because we're virtual now? Have there been any changes to the org? Um, how are you thinking differently about the org? You mentioned yeah. working remotely from home, those types of things. Yeah, sure, so first, from a tactical standpoint, um, we're moving some resources around, right? We won't get too much more specific than that, but there are some areas where there's, the demand is incredible and there's some areas where it's not quite as robust. So we're, we're, we're having to move some folks around. Um, but, but I think it is a lot of what I talked about before, uh, and I'll just double click on one point. I think, um, you know, Phil, you and I talked about, we miss the interaction. We miss the energy we yeah. get from our teams. Um, Phil and I had the chance to, to go to a meeting, we had to see some products that are coming out next year. Um, and we stood like out in the boiling sun for an extra 30 minutes just because I think we all missed just the human interaction. Um, so I'm thinking about how to safely get people together to start thinking and planning and, and using the group dynamics again, because that's the piece that's missing. I think we all felt as individuals, we're doing okay, we're contributing, we're doing our jobs. Um, but I feel that way too, but I'm sure my boss, our CEO, has a point of view that he misses something. I have a point of view that I miss when you are in the room with our, your other colleagues, Phil, yeah. um, and that group dynamic. So I'm thinking about how to carve out one of their conference rooms, literally, in, in Ridgefield Park, and how do we carve it up and say, okay, maybe once every uh, one or two weeks, we're all going to get together, and we're going to tackle one of these long, hard-pressing topics, um, you know, such as how are consumers going to shop in the future? Where are they going to go? Um, our business, you know, we do a lot of business online and offline. Um, consumers like to touch and feel the home appliances or the TVs. You know, all that's going to change. So we need to think about that as a, a group, uh, not just as individuals. So I'm thinking about how to enable that and bring people together safely uh, from a tactical standpoint and then use more technology. My setup here, I, I did a temporary setup. I, I'm not a work from home. I, I'm not disciplined enough to do this. So for me, this was all really new. Um, my monitor is still sitting on a 500 sheet ream of paper. Um, <laughs> I've even decided now it's time to make this a, a real office uh, and make this more uh, functional for long term. So I'll make myself more comfortable and I want to see how we can do that for our teams. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And, you know, it, it's a good transition to some of the questions that are grouped around technology and product, right? We we, we can't hide the fact we are a technology company. We don't want to. Um, but there are questions about you know, how is our technology helping during these times? And, you know, there's an ask if there's any innovation we could share coming down the pike. We probably won't secrets do that. Stuff. Secrets? <laughs> yeah, secrets, because uh, we know there's probably friends and colleagues from other companies on the, on this uh, <laughs> webinar. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you. Uh, but if you could share maybe how current products are starting to sure. uh, be consumed based on the environment we're in now. Yeah, let's start simple, tactical, obvious, um, something like a monitor. Um, mm. I bought a new monitor. Um, the one I had was not big enough. It was used for just sporadically. So uh, that was the first thing where we can see people are using. Second, the large screen TV in your living room uh, suddenly was being used for uh, education at home, work from home. People were needing, how do you connect it? So we saw our call center get tons of questions on how do you connect your PC to your TV? How do I, uh, you know, cast something from this device to this device? So it, it's really interesting how the connectivity of devices has always been there for, for the last five to 10 years. And now people are, because of need, it's been moving up to the forefront. So things like that are very clear, but also our home appliance portfolio. Um, let's face it, 100% of us are cooking more at home. Uh, the dishwasher is running every day in my house, sometimes twice a day. Um, the Family Hub connected refrigerator that I'm fortunate enough to have in my kitchen is my favorite product that we make. Uh, and, and that's a connected device. So on that device, I can see if someone hits the ring doorbell, I see who's in there. So, you know, this idea that I'm always getting packages, I don't have to leave my, my kitchen, I know what's going on. It tells me what's going on with my smart home, all for my refrigerator. Um, these are the types of things that now people are really starting to value. So that's all in the consumer world. On the business and the B2B side of the world, it's completely changed so much. Um, you can imagine as corporation and buildings and other, I just saw it this morning, um, AMC Cinemas is gonna try to open up 100 of their cinemas. Um, we, we're partnering with people who make kiosks. So it's our displays, 
and another company's technology and it checks your temperature on the way in. Uh, it screens you. Oh yeah, you're, you're Phil Cohn, you're allowed to come in, take your temperature uh, and the gate opens up and you're good to go. Uh, these were things that were not even necessary, you know, a mere four or five months ago, and they're unfortunately necessary now. Uh, wayfinding and contactless interaction is huge. Uh, so all of our display products on the B2B side, you're going to see so many more of those things, that, you know, telling you what to do, where to go, stand here, move here, um, interact, checking your temperature. Um, so it's endless, um, and, and it's, again, fascinating academically how something like this will change the landscape of our business. Uh, but I think we're so fortunate to live in a time where technology uh, can enable our productivity such that the impacts are real and significant, but they could have been and they would have been much worse without all this technology. Yep. OK, the question line is lighting up now. Uh, so obviously you mentioned it. We're, we're a Korean company, uh, U.S. subsidiary of a Korean company. So there's questions about how has during this virus when um you know suan and seoul where we're headquarters uh continue to operate you yeah. know quote unquote more normal um how has that relationship with us and korea changed and you know how are we managing to keep the communication lines open so it really has not changed other than the physical meetings um our culture at samsung specifically uh we really value face-to-face -face interaction um it's important that we get to know each other on the personal level so that we can perform better on the professional level. That's a basic tenet of Samsung. Um, so that's been hard. Uh, now, luckily, we've built relationships over many, many years, so we, we have that to, to lean on. Um, again, it, the longer this goes on, the more challenging it is. But our relationship between the countries has been has been tremendous. I think I, I'm on a video conference at least one to two times per week um, with the folks across the pond. And, and the communication is great. Uh, it, you know, it, the old adage, you don't have time to write the long notes, so you write the short one, right? So you really have to be crisp, you have to be straightforward, you have to be simple, you have to be clear and get to the point and, and highlight the things that really matter. And that's what we're doing now, so it's very efficient. Um, you know, it's interesting, culturally, um, Asian culture, Japan, Korea, the countries we've traveled a lot to through the years, Phil, we always used to see the masks, right? Yeah. And they're worn not when you were trying not to get sick, but they were always worn when you were sick. I right. mean, um, I would look at that and I'm, I didn't understand it, frankly, as, as a Westerner. <laughs> and, um, you know, this idea that, you know, these masks are, are there to, to help on both sides is real. And, and in Korea, it's always been the way. Um, and our buildings have never shut there. The schools shut for some periods and opened up. Um, but that country did a great job of contact tracing. Um, you know, and, and we, we're struggling with that here because of the privacy aspect. Right. Uh, you know, there were apps that were created in South Korea. You know, so they don't tell you who, but hey, some person had it. They lived in your building. They shopped at this store. They were here. And you need to quarantine if you've been impacted by any of those things. Um, and, and that contact tracing combined with the cultural acceptance of distancing and masks really helped keep that down to a manageable level. So they've been kind of steady. Um, our office has never shut there. Um, and our interaction has been wonderful because of the technology. Now, again, it's six months from now. If we're still in this, it's going to be hard uh, because right. we, we lean so heavily on that personal relationship here at Samsung. Yeah, and Joe, you mentioned personal relationship not only with Korea but face to face with our customers, and yeah. and you talked about CES going virtual and and another big show in the fall going virtual, and usually we go to Korea with our customers in November, and and we're figuring that out. As a leader in this time, how do you how do you think about how to create that face to face experience in the absence of being face to face? Yeah, it's 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 hard, and and I'll give. A lot of the teams in Samsung, a lot of credit. I've already seen extremely innovative uh, things. We create, we have an internal trade show uh, that the B2B team uh, ran for us called the VX Virtual Experience, and it was quite remarkable. It was so interesting how um, you know there was a feel of an actual trade show. There was a lobby, and you could click on something, and then there were some videos in there. Um, it's not the same. It's certainly not the same, but. Um, it's it's a great proxy for this feeling of trying to generate excitement. And to me, that's the piece that's hardest. Um, when I'm with someone and, and I'm someone's presenting to me and I feel their energy or passion, it gets me excited, right? So as you know, Phil, you and I, we're always trying to do the same with our customers. And 
when you're genuinely excited about the prospects of business for each other, uh, that comes through. So that's the piece that we're still, you know, how do you do that uh, over a video call is a little harder. Um, but, you know, you can imagine we have tools already that are designed to break down a lot of those barriers, a lot of the technology, um, showing some of those products to these customers virtually, doing guided tours. You, if you go on Samsung.com, you're going to start to see a lot more of these uh, guided tours and these chat sessions and everything uh, trying to replace that human connection. Um, there is no replacement for it, but I think we can right. you know, get 70, 80 percent efficient with it. And I think it's good. I, I think without that, they wouldn't need us, Phil. They, you know, they don't need hey. two, two guys from yeah. Jersey to help sell some products if you could just uh, have a computer do it. <laughs> I know exactly. Um, but, you know, it is interesting if you if you think about five months ago. I don't think uh, we knew what you know how to do WebEx this efficiently, right. or go to meeting this efficiently, or Zoom. I mean, most people Zoom is common speak now, and it wasn't back then. So you talk about reinventing resiliency, trying to make those connections is critical. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about product. We talk about leadership in our company. Um, you know, one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is the consumer and what we're seeing is leaders changing about how consumers consume our products or any products out there. And you mentioned S.com, Samsung.com, but, you know, even in our retail channel, which is a huge part of our business, wow. how they're pivoting to online. So when you think about that uh, over the last five months, as a leader, how do you think about how we plan the business differently? You know, there's a questions on. Uh, a question or two on hiring. How yeah. do we hire differently as leaders? Maybe right. you could share some thoughts on that. Let me start with the last one first, because uh, I think it's it's really interesting. Um, first of all, I think from a hiring standpoint, I mentioned you know diversity before is is something top of mind for me recently, and I know you too, Phil. As our as our organizations are not diverse enough, um, and we're starting to do a much better job in Samsung with our ERG groups. Um, we have women at Samsung Electronics, we have Galaxy of Black Professionals, we have veterans, we have LGBTQ, et cetera. So I think raising a top of mind, first of all, but I always I always start to chuckle to myself and I try to remind myself before every interview, um, if, if you and I have an interview, Phil, our basis of common knowledge of things like sports and other things is a lot easier. And I kind of always get sucked into that conversation. Someone yeah. will check us up on LinkedIn and, you know, talk about... Rutgers sports or talk about Giants or Yankees with us and it's easy conversation uh, but someone that we don't share that background with it's not as easy so I, I always find myself trying to not be biased by those types of conversations because the candidates are using every tool they have but our job as hiring managers and leaders is to try to find the common elements that are there and to try and make sure that our teams um, are, are getting the diversity that they need by casting the net more effectively by looking in, in places that we've never looked before. And then when, when you when you start to get that proper screening and, and you, we start to get some diverse candidates, more to your question now about the onboarding, right? How do yeah. you onboard during this period of, of virtual experiences? And I've spoken to a couple folks who have either come into Samsung or friends and colleagues of ours that are moving from other companies. Um, and some are doing it a lot better than others is, is what I'm hearing and feeling. We just did um, our intern campaign this year 100% virtual and it was different and it was not as good but I'm so happy that those interns we were able to maintain the program so that those interns got some interesting experience that they can write home about um, you know all these experiences we're getting um, you know we're getting paid to live these experiences you, you know you don't have to go to school in 10 years to learn about what do people do during COVID um, right. you know we lived it and, and we have to leverage these experiences but this onboarding and these interns especially what I felt was um, on their readouts of their projects, the thing that they were missing a little bit was the internal culture of the company, right? So they were proposing some solutions. We call them um, uh, CEO problem solvers. Uh, and, and it was a session and we, we picked really hard topics and interns would give us answers. And, you know, the functional expertise was always there and it's always there and you could feel it. But I sensed the difference between prior years was they weren't grasping who we were as a company or the industry as deeply and all those subtleties that are there because there wasn't that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So that when we're onboarding people now, we've onboarded several during this time, of course. Um, you know, we do all the technical things fine. Um, we meet with them, we do the one-on-ones, 
But then there's that moment, and I spoke to a person last week, they're home in their office, they don't know anyone, they have some roles and responsibilities, but you're kind of lost, right? That's the moment where you'd probably get up from your desk and walk to a colleague and say, explain this to me a little bit better. You know, I don't want to set a Zoom meeting and schedule 30 minutes with you and be so formal, but I just like to have a cup of coffee and help me understand why is this and how does this work? Um, I think we all have to, uh, you know, break down those barriers uh, of, of be, this is a formal interaction still, right? right. I, I'm not a formal person as much. You're not a formal person. Um, we love, you and I do a lot of drive-bys all day long, right? And without that, and you have a new employer on your team, and I mentioned to you a couple of times, right? I would have met that person three or four times. I would know that person. I would be, now be able to call them and say, hey, I need something. I need some help. Um, so that's not there. And that's just something we as leaders have to figure out a different way to do um, and, yeah. and schedule kind of these things and make the informality, you know, possible. Yeah, uh, couldn't agree with you more, Joe. And and that, I think, as leaders is the biggest challenge. How do we continue to instill um, the recipe for success at our company? Because that's what we get paid to do for new employees or rising stars. And that brings me to a, a whole host of questions, probably from either recent grads or people who will be graduating um, around what does it take to be successful in our company? Mm -hmm. And do we have any formal leadership development programs? And actually, we do. We have an LDP called Leadership yeah. Development Program uh, that helps provide for our rising stars a platform to grow and 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 uh, learn. So I think what's for Samsung uniquely, um, there's a lot of commonalities, right, that I think are not maybe as interesting. I don't know. Uh, but uniquely at Samsung, uh, there's a couple key things. Um, First is, is communication, right? I called out your communication style and skills, Phil, before. Um, but we move, people tell us that join our company, we move really fast. And that's very uncomfortable sometimes when you're a new employee. Um, so communication skills are vital. Um, and there's a rhythm and a cadence that, that really works at Samsung. And without giving away any trade secrets, I, you know, it's, the basics of it are essentially understanding the key elements, breaking them down, providing an option A or B, a recommendation and a Y, right? If you if you follow that, um, it takes away this kind of, hey, I wasn't sure what to do, so I gave you a 10-page PowerPoint and maybe we can go either way, uh, but it also forces you to really understand the content and the material of, the, of the, the need or the issue or the opportunity such that you can very succinctly say, here's what's going on, I think we could do A or B, I think it's B and here's Y. That's just kind of one rhythm that really works well at Samsung because we're moving fast and the technology industry um, speed to market is an undeniable advantage. Um, and that's the other thing. We're a messy company. Um, we'd rather go fast and, and, and clean up a little afterward than get it perfectly correct every time. Um, and, and culturally and style wise, that's very different than some folks who may have worked, let's say, in CPG industries where... You know, that's a big ship and then subtle nudges are what's required and appropriate. Um, you know, we're a big bat and you've got to you've got to really uh, shove something for it to, to move. So right now at Samsung, I think people coming in, especially in this environment, have to have great communication skills, have to understand speed is critical, um, have to be uncomfortable being have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's something I found really interesting and hard. Um, your day is always full and you never get everything done. And there's always an opportunity to do something a little bit better. Uh, but that's where you have to step back and think through, okay, I can, I can get it perfect or I can get, you know, I can get 80, 90% and we can really get an advantage in the market and, and who can adapt to that style or not. Um, so I think those are a couple of kind of unique things uh, about Samsung. Yeah, I think that's that's good, Joe, and a good overview. And, you know, they asked about leadership development program. Yes, for yeah, those sorry. people who come in, we do have a formal leadership development program, especially for high potential. And they rotate uh, throughout the company in the U.S. and in Korea sometimes in different functional areas. Yeah, yeah we're on year, year five of that now. Uh, this is our fifth cohort coming in. Um, yeah. And these are the future future leaders and general managers of the business. So that's a real exciting program for sure. 
Okay. You know, uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, fast and uncomfortable and, you know, every company has their themes and we have plenty of them, you know, but doing what you can and owning the unknown Mm -hmm. really underscore the culture of our company. Because I mentioned before as a leader, uh, you know, I hate ambiguity when I'm communicating, but I, that doesn't mean we're communicating 100% of the information because we never have 100% of the information. So it's, for me, hiring is always about how comfortable people are moving forward, taking measured risk without 100% of the information, right? You told me when I came on board for my second stint, because I was here in 04 uh, for a little bit, but you told me that, you know, it's about getting 80% of it right, but moving quick, learning quick, and iterating quick. And that's how we're successful. Is that what I said? That was good, Phil. That's what I said. Yeah, I wrote it down. It was good. I played it back during the interview. It was very good. Um, you know, some more questions coming up. Uh, are we hiring? Uh, yeah, I listen. Always, always hiring, uh, you know, to Joe's point, uh, putting resources in the right places where we think there's growth um, with the right capabilities. And one of the things, Joe, you, you touched on before, but I want to double click on because it it does address a few questions is the skill sets, um, the, the hard skill sets, not the soft skills of ambiguity and, you know, fast, but digital, right? And how consumers are now purchasing digital um, more so than ever, right? Online in that journey and kind of what you're thinking about what's going to stick when we look in the future about, you know, the capabilities we need as a as an employer and um, in general, what do you think is going to stick that uh, we've kind of pivoted to during sure. the, the lockdown, if you will? So digital is an interesting um, topic because I think most companies, most larger companies went through the so-called digital transformation a few years ago. Um, and, and the natural process to go through there is to first put everything that's digital aside and put it in a different group um, so that we can be sure we cultivate the skills, get the proper um, resources, skill sets, people, structure to drive it, but then at some point it has to get embedded back into the organization, and we like to say it should be the oxygen or the electricity of the organization because there's no longer digital marketing or digital selling or digital anything. It's just selling or marketing or logistics. It, digital first is just how we do everything these days and it's how the world is moving. At the same time, it doesn't mean that people aren't you know, going into stores still, you know, for a lot of our categories that are very considered purchases, like a, a major appliance or a large screen TV, believe it or not, even, you know, even during COVID right now, uh, the majority of people still go into a store to touch the field, to see, uh, to check the quality, to look at the finish. Um, so, but it's also this obvious and overused word called omni-channel going on. Um, when I was trained, you know, in product and product marketing, there was the classic funnel. Um, you start with awareness and consideration and purchase and post-purchase. Um, you know, we can blow all that up right now. Um, the, I like the one description of former colleague. It's just a, a merry-go-round. Yeah. The customer is seeing things in all different places and different times in different ways. And at some point, they just get shot off. And now they're ready to buy. And you don't know where they're coming from or how they got to you sometimes or what uh, where they are in their journey. But if they're ready to buy, you have to be relevant. Um, but there also is the folks that, you know, Hey, it's eight o'clock at night. I'm just thinking about that next car, or that next TV, if you will. And I'm just researching. And, and how do I do that? And how does uh, you know, every touch point we have at Samsung, it's got to be relevant for the customer that's trying to interact with us. So maybe you need a service issue. Maybe you've got a question. Hey, how do I connect these two things, as I was mentioning before? Or maybe yeah. you're just like, hey, what's the deal with 8K TVs coming out? I hear something about them. So you know, our expertise is constantly changing and we're trying to be where the customers want us to be with the relevant information for them. So that's mandatory. That's table stakes. Uh, now we're talking about, OK, in this COVID world, um, how do I take that experience that was in store um, and transfer it to digital? Um, that's not as easy, um, but we have some pretty cool, unique, innovative ways that I probably shouldn't get into too much more. But that's where the skill sets come in. Our organization says, you can't be doing any function today and not have a baseline knowledge of how digital works and how to drive digital. Um, but I also am a firm believer that it's time to embed it back into every organization. I've seen our customers, Phil, go through this too, where you know many retailers had separate .com 
you know, the beginning was under um, the mainstream, then they spread it out, and now it's all kind of coming back. Uh, because we realize there's just one journey. There's not separate journeys for the for the shopper. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, sorry, Bill. In terms of things that may stick, um, the online shopping almost doubled overnight uh, when COVID happened, and that forced people who were on the fringes and ah, I'm not really comfortable with online shopping. Um, you know, I won't be stereotypical, but my my father, he's now an online shopper, right? He he couldn't do anything before, but boy, he can order from Amazon like nobody's business these days. So <laughs> um, it, it opened up online by necessity to a whole new generation. Um, but it also did something quite interesting. Um, Gen X and millennials, um, you know, they, Gen Z and millennials, excuse me, the world was a small screen to them for the most part. Uh, and now during COVID, um, they've opened up to the larger screen as well as the small screen. Um, there's so much been so much stay at home education on the larger screen in the TV or entertainment on a large screen because it's now uh, you know, a familial thing to do and not just a personal thing. Uh, we've seen those attitudes change and, and you know, some kids are actually lifting their heads up and, and, and looking around and, and <laughs> seeing what's going on around them inside the home. So I think some of those trends will continue. The people who are not hardcore online shoppers will shop a little more. Uh, people who didn't, who viewed the world only through a small screen, I think will also view the world through a larger screen and cooking from home. Uh, we have a lot of research that says people will cook from home more often, at least over the next 12 months, no matter what happens outside, because they've had a lot of fun. You know, we've all seen the sourdough starter, you know, conversations, <laughs> right. the bread making. Um, I've had more banana bread in the last three months than I've had, uh, you know, the rest of my <laughs> life, I think. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think will stick like that going forward. Um, and that's our fun part as leaders now to think about uh, and being resourceful enough to figure out which ones will and how to, you know, as Gretzky said, how do you skate to that puck? Yeah, and that's that's a good uh, segue into the next question about being resource, resourceful and thinking what's going to stick. There's a lot of R's in this conversation. Rutgers needs to add re relevancy and uh, to that as well. Um, anyway, uh, when we talk about, um, you know, what's going to stick, there's a question about our environment and um you know you talk about remote working right and mm -hmm. working from home and you mentioned before asian companies we work for including samsung are very traditional in their thought about you're not working unless you're in the office what what are your thoughts about a leader as a leader an executive leader you know with all of your employees how do you think about that as we go forward yeah you know sharing a little uh you know inside baseball but to your direct question phil we were we were all a little concerned because uh culturally it is it is you know face to face you know we just think it, it it's important and valuable and i think we were able to open everyone's eyes to the fact that we were able, we were able to perform at a high level um and doing so virtually so i am confident actually that the workplace will be changed forever at samsung and everywhere um i, I don't think it'll be zero to 100 or 100 to zero but I think I personally have more confidence that I can do my role sporadically at home if necessary. I have confidence in you, Phil, and everyone else that you can do your roles virtually. Um, and I also still believe, though, that there's there's benefit to getting together. So, you know, some of these, I, I think it will change the way we physically structure corporate offices. Um, I, I think a lot more uh, space for communal activities. It was interesting, you know, the, the 10 years ago, the whole world was moving towards these communal spaces. Um, and then we started to find out that maybe they weren't so productive when everyone was there every day sitting there and it was loud. Um, but now I think the need for those types of communal spaces is, is obvious, right? When we do come to the office, it should be because we want to share experiences and share the energy. And, you know, offices are not set up for that. Offices have literal walls and cubes and they're designed to separate and give you a little privacy. Um, right. I think that view of the world is completely different going forward. So I think that will change. Um, and I think we're going to do, we've been very efficient. It's very fun some days to not have to travel to Seattle or Minneapolis or Bentonville, but I can do all three in one day. I think you've done it too, Phil, right? So sure. I, I think we're going to also find that for these check-in moments, we can do it virtually and be really efficient. Um, so it's a little scary if I'm an airline or if I'm a hotel, a business hotel especially, but uh, as always, things will evolve. So I think those are two things that are that are destined to stay uh, as a change from our corporate environment. 
Yeah, I think one final question. I know we're coming up against time, but uh, I think it's a good way to end. What What is the one, uh, you know, most useful or favorite leadership principle at Samsung uh, that, you know, you've used during the, the virus uh, or the, the quarantine um, that you think is going to be either magnified or, uh, you know, um, continue to stick as we go outside I, you know and i'll i'll just start one off because it's not fair to throw a, a, a curveball at you but but for me it's about staying connected i didn't realize you know i think we get caught in the day-to-day -day when we're face to face how many people you don't talk to right. um that now we connect with and we learn from so for me it's it certainly and i think that's what makes us uh successful whether we're in this environment or not it's about staying connected, but not only to the people that you see all the time. It's really about those those golden nuggets that you get beneath the surface from people that you don't talk to all the time. Yeah, for me, Phil, I, I think it's it's all about empathy. Um, I think the more you can walk a mile in someone else's shoes and think about what they're going through in the moment, whether it's you know, you as a leader and, and me trying to think about the, all right, the challenges that you have and not just dumping another challenge on on your plate. I know I do that too much, but um, or our customers and, and, you know, what are their challenges? You know, during the height of the crisis, you know, if we're being honest, Phil, you and I spoke to a lot of principals and owners and executives who weren't sure that their businesses would survive. Yeah. Right. And trying to talk to them in the moment about a new product we're launching was not appropriate or relevant, not helpful and not commercially uh, productive for either of us. So I, I think, you know, empathy is a skill that uh, is I've leaned on a lot more recently and I've seen you and other leaders do the same. So I think to me that that's critical. You have to understand what are people going through in the moment um, and also the long game. This is you know, we we value the long game at Samsung because. Uh, you know, we are leaders in many of these industries, we say humbly, um, but we could we could have short term maximized some things. But I think we, in playing the long game and being an empathetic, truly consultative partner, whether, again, that's internal or external, I think that will benefit you as a leader and, and, and your company long term. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Margaret, I think I'll turn it back to you to help us close out. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, you guys were so much fun to listen to. Clearly such great chemistry and you know, letting us in on, on your playbook <laughs> and the successes and challenges. It was it was fantastic. And thanks too for starting um the QA session early, seeing that we were getting so many great questions. Um our audience really in, enhanced things um with uh you know, enhanced the discussion with all of those. So so thanks everyone. Um, when we got started earlier, I alluded to um, something called the Thousand Laptop Challenge, and I just wanted to revisit that. Um, it's a fairly new component of the Signature Leadership Series, and we brought it to you because RBS students and their families have endured financial hardships since COVID-19 rocked all of our worlds. They um, quickly entered into a remote learning environment that required technology, such as laptops, that simp many simply can't afford. Our corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors can help by donating to the Thousand Laptop Challenge Fund. And you'll all receive um, an email with information about how you can be part of this important initiative and a link to the donation um, webpage. And we do appreciate and need uh, generous support. Yeah, and Margaret, if I could just chime in here, you know, I do serve on the Dean's Advisory Board at the Rutgers Business School, and it's eye opening to me. You know, we think people go virtual, learn virtual, it's easy. There are plenty of Rutgers students that don't have laptops that they can use at home or Wi-Fi connections, and we're trying to help them out. So any assistance, um, I know, uh, uh, you know, my company is trying to lean in, but any assistance anyone on this call or your companies could help out with would be appreciated. And I know we're coming up against time, so I want to make sure I say thank you to Margaret and the Rutgers Business School team. I want to thank Joe and Samsung for giving us the platform to share some of our insights and uh, thank everyone who attended and the sponsors that helped sponsored uh, our leadership uh, seminar today. Gosh, Thanks, Phil, Phil, thank you so much. I think you hit on hit on all the points. Um, and so everyone, our next uh, session coming up um, is- Oh, I know, Frank, that's gonna be good. I'll show up to Frank's. He's a Excellent. board member with, he's a good guy. Excellent.
Good. Um, well, we hope that uh, you will join us and that uh, members of our audience will join us um, uh, and we'll share information about that uh, via email um, for folks. And we also ask that everyone stay on very briefly to um, participate in a two question survey about today's event um, because we want these uh, sessions to continue to meet your needs. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now. Bye-bye.